it's an exciting time to be in Georgia. We want to change that perception uh, that we may be lagging in education. And we're well on the way to doing that. We've got to now focus on implementation. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today. And I can't think of a better person to talk about that than Michael Horn because he has his pulse on what is going on in digital learning throughout the country. Whenever Newsweek, when you write a book and Newsweek puts it number 14 on the list of 50 books for our times, you know you've done a pretty good job. The name of that book was Disrupting Class, How Disruptive Innovation Will Change the Way the World Learns, which he co-authored in 2008. Now we're very lucky to have Michael. He came to us all the way from California, and he did it last night amidst all the storms, uh, and he made it here. I was a little bit nervous, but uh, he is the co-founder and executive director of education at the Clayton Christensen Institute for Disruptive Innovation, which is a nonprofit think tank, just like us, devoted to applying the theories of disruptive innovation to problems in the social sector. He's been a keynote speaker at many conferences, virtual school symposium, the Microsoft School of the Future World Summit, and most impressively, the 2011 Georgia Legislative Policy Forum. Uh, he has his MBA from Harvard, graduated from Yale, and he has been a great friend of ours as we rely on him for guidance on policy to help us navigate over the last four or five years as we put these policies in place. And again, we're very excited to have him. Please welcome Michael Horn. Thank you so much. It's a uh, real pleasure to be back in Georgia. The Georgia uh, Public Policy Foundation has been a real uh, friend to us as well. It, I, I get to work with a lot of the uh, state-based think tanks uh, focused on free market policies around the uh, country uh, in my work. And I will say that there's a handful uh, that really stand out for their efforts to uh, really push uh, a student-centric education future for our, our, our uh, students. And uh, Kelly and your team really stands out. I, I, I correspond with Mike uh, behind the camera uh, once every couple weeks as he uh, gets some of my writing out to our readers in Georgia on your website. And uh, it's just, it's the work that you're uh, doing and continue to do is just absolutely vital uh, to the future, not just of Georgia, but for this country. So appreciate that, Kelly. The, uh, what I, what I thought I would do today is maybe take a different tack from what I often do. I'm, I'm speaking later today to the Governor's Digital Learning Task Force. Uh, and so as, as a result, I uh, was going to talk a lot about competency-based learning and mastery-based learning. So I thought what I would do for these remarks is sort of give a shorter version of uh, some of those uh, pieces of it. And then I'll pivot, and you'll see, because I'll, I'll accelerate through a few slides a little rapidly and uh, pivot to just talking about uh, how digital learning is unfolding across the country right now in its many different forms and what that uh, is looking like in actual classrooms and learning environments across America. And I, I see a lot of friends out there, Sajans here, uh, doing a lot of that work that we're relying on and reflecting uh, as, as we're describing the universe of innovation happening right now. It's a particularly exciting time uh, in education Higher education tends to be getting the headlines right now in the New York Times and Wall Street Journal and so forth, uh, but in K-12 education as well. Online and blended learning are growing rapidly across the country, uh, and my sense is that uh, despite policy in some places, uh, what we're going to see is in, in disrupting class, we made this prediction that by 2019, 50% of all high school courses would be delivered online in some form or fashion. My sense is that that prediction is going to be roughly true, almost regardless of what policymakers do. The question, I think, is will it be any good? And will it actually create a student-centric education system? And to me, that's the big question. And a, and a critical piece of that is thinking about creating the right conditions for innovation. And then, as Kelly said, to really help educators focus on the implementation on the ground. Uh, but it's a big shift for the way we've historically regulated and thought about uh, uh, education, public education in this country. And so I, I thought I'd start with this overriding question about what is competency-based learning and why, in my opinion, is it one of a handful of policies that is absolutely critical to getting right so that we have the right conditions on the ground for this innovation to truly create this student-centric education system 
that can allow each child to realize his or her fullest human potential. And I actually thought I would sort of talk about this uh, as I want to do from the innovation perspective by telling a story uh, from far outside uh, of education. And I thought I would tell it um, from the perspective of building cars. Now, some people in the audience might, you might say it's kind of inappropriate to talk about building cars and educating students. But uh, bear with me a little bit. The, um, what the story I want to tell is one of our friends, uh, Steve Spear, who's a professor at MIT. He's not as good as Georgia Tech, and you'll see why shortly. Um, uh, was, uh, uh, building, uh, was studying the uh, car manufacturing process in both uh, one of the Detroit automakers and then with Toyota. And uh, some years ago, he actually went to one of the Detroit automakers and got put on the assembly line where his job was to install the uh, passenger seat in the front. And so when he showed up to work, uh, an interesting process sort of came out. He, he got over there and the person who was working that station said, welcome Steve to our assembly line. We're glad you're here. What's going to happen is that the seat and the car is going to come down the line every 58 seconds and all you're going to have to do is snap this over here and you're going to push this there and then snap this here and so on and voila you'll install the seat and then you'll get ready for the next one a couple seconds later because you got 58 seconds to do each of these. You see how to do it Steve? Now Steve had degrees from Princeton and MIT and so he said yeah I see how to do that this is no problem and so the first seat came down the line and he tried to move this here and did this here and the thing just did not install properly at all and by the end of the 58 seconds the guy had to stop the line and, and pull the cord, the rip cord if you will and uh, redo it for him and in the course of an hour Steve only installed four <coughs> seats correctly. Now you see why I'm saying Georgia Tech's got some things on uh, MIT but the, um, but the uh, re really interesting thing then is that you see from this process why inspection at the end of the car man at the end of the assembly line was such a critical part of the Detroit automakers process because you couldn't guarantee that someone had put in their particular part accurately at the outset and so you'd have to do inspection or what in education we call summative assessment at the end of the with the car coming off to see what percentage of defects and so forth that you had to do so that you could send it back to rework what in education we call remediation or credit recovery uh, so that we could rehabilitate, if you will, the car. Now, when Steve, however, went to Toyota, he had a very different experience. Here, basically the person who was uh, helping him with install uh, right uh, passenger, sorry, the pa front passenger seat said, Steve, you see, there's seven steps to installing the uh, passenger seat. And we're going to teach you the first step right now. And you're not allowed to move on to learning the second step until you've mastered the first step. If you master it in 10 minutes, then you can start learning the second step right away. And if it takes you an hour, then it takes you an hour. And if it takes you a day, it takes you a day. But you don't have the right to learn the second step until you've truly mastered every single time how to do the first step. Now, think about that. He had to master each of those seven steps before he was allowed to go to the assembly line and actually start installing these passenger seats. Which means that by the time he actually got to that place on the assembly line, Steve knew how to do this process correctly every single time. And Toyota didn't have to do the massive inspections at the end of the assembly line to see what percentage defects they had in their cars because they could verify that their workers actually knew correctly how to install everything right from the outset. So assessment was still a critical part of this system, but it was literally built into the instructional process for teaching Steve how to install these passenger seats. And what a world of difference for the process. Now, as we think about education, and how our education system works today, which one does it fall into? It looks a lot like that uh, Detroit system in many ways. What happens is uh, we have a system with fixed time and variable learning. And so we deliver content experiences to students, much in the way I'm doing right now. And then 
just actually answer me, um, I'll, I'll call on you, which will be unusual, but say you're in the middle of a three-week unit in, uh, in high school math, say. What happens at the end of the three-week unit? You get a test, right? So we test and assess, and then what happens? Every student moves on, regardless of the percentage correct that they actually mastered or whether they even got a passing grade, and you get the results only afterward, but you've kept moving on and the point of learning has passed. Now contrast this with a competency-based learning system where you still offer learning experiences for students and you still test and assess because testing and assessment is absolutely critical, but now it's interwoven into the instructional process so you get almost real-time and interactive feedback that informs what students do next and you only truly progress once students have actually mastered the learning. What a world of difference this creates. Now, the challenge is that our education system was actually uh, modeled to, uh, upon factories, similar to the Detroit line. And so the whole goal was actually to look like a factory, to standardize the way we teach and test. And we do it quite well. And the purpose of it, though, was to have an education system fit for the Industrial Revolution, to literally produce students that would be great line workers in factories and so forth. And your purpose was not to educate every single child successfully. Instead, the purpose was actually to sort students out at various intervals. The thought experiment I like to do is what if Thomas Jefferson were to come back alive today and look at our education system? What would his reaction be? And I actually think he'd spike the football and declare success. Because if you read his writings, what he said very clearly in his letters to Virginia was that uh, he wanted a system that would basically sort students out into different groups by ability. The first sorting would be the, the, uh, the, the large mass of workers, if you will. The second sorting would be people that went a little bit further in their schooling and would be able to be the managers of those workers, in effect. And then the third group would be a very small group that would advance to higher education, very small group, who would be fit for the political leadership of the country. And in effect, our school system does that really quite well. The problem is that the world happens to have changed into a knowledge economy for which we need to prepare every single student to be a contributing member, of not just of the workforce, but of society. So the demands have changed, and so this education system uh, creates this thing in education that we call the Swiss cheese problem, where because you can't verify that students have learned every single concept when they progress, you get huge holes in their learning. And this just doesn't make sense for this reality. And so the question is, how do we move to this competency-based learning system that's really uh, focused on mastery and so forth? And I just thought I'd give a definition from the work that I call, which is the K-12 International Online Learning Association, uh, and uh, competency works gives for what mastery based learning at a high quality is and, and they basically as you can see have five parts of their definition the first part is that students only advance when they actually have mastered concepts not based on the calendar so you don't create these holes in your learning the second thing is that competencies include explicit measurable transferable learning objectives that empower students so what that means is that the concepts have to be transparent to students ahead of time. So they actually understand what the standards that they're responsible for learning, and that they can start to become owners of their own learning as well, which is drastically different than the way we do education today. The third thing is that assessment is meaningful and positive experience for <coughs> students because it helps inform what they need to do next. And it becomes a learning tool as opposed to a punitive one. The, uh, the, the last two really speak to the high quality aspect of this, which is that students receive differentiated support for their individual learning needs. And then the last ones um, are that the learning outcomes actually emphasize uh, the, uh, the application and creation of knowledge, along with the importance of uh, skills and dispositions and so forth. So not just a narrow uh, academic curriculum, if you will, but something that actually prepares you to be successful in life. Now, what I think this is interesting is that as Common Core, which of course has become a big topic of discussion, not just in Georgia, but across the country, uh, has, is that 
My, my sense is that actually a lot of the worries around Common Core that are being expressed right now are, are misguided in several respects and not actually huge concerns. But I do think that there are some big concerns about Common Core, which is that in the next couple of years, we're going to be putting in place an assessment system to measure how students are actually doing on these new Common Core standards. And I think there's huge questions there about how that's going to work out. And my sense is that if we approached it with a competency-based learning mindset, we might see a very different uh, 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 result occur. Um, and so the questions that I posed are, at, in, in the current track right now of, of Common Core, will the new assessments by the two assessment consortia that are being built, will they be truly different from the old assessments that we have in place today? That is, will they be more, uh, uh, less narrow than the current assessments? Will they actually uh, measure authentic learning tasks rather than just simply fill in the blank, multiple choice sorts of uh, questions? The second one is, will the assessments that we have coming down the uh, pipeline right now doom the Common Core because of their length, literally how long they are? The third is, will states be able to handle the infrastructure needs that the next generation assessments uh, require? That is, the next generation assessments are going to be online, uh, and will schools actually have the bandwidth and computing infrastructure to handle these, or will this cause them to walk? And then the fourth question I have up there is, will states stick with the Common Core once they see the results? Because if it's truly clear and higher standards, got news for you, the country is going to get a bit of a shock when they realize that our students are doing even worse than we thought that they were. Now, so let me actually flip the question and say, what happens in a competency-based learning system and sort of answer these four questions? Because I think if we attacked it from that mindset, we could actually save the Common Core and make it much more productive than what I think is going to happen right now. So the first one is, will the assessments be truly different today? And it's tied into that question because of the assessments and their length. So. For some of you who are reading uh, uh, the news from Smarter Balanced or PARC, which are the two assessment consortia, you've seen that the assessments that they're promising for the end of the year are somewhere between six and 10 hours long for a given uh, student. Now, I, I, I've got to ask you, as a parent, are you excited about your students spending a, a couple weeks in assessment for 10 hours a day? I wouldn't be. Now, but the, 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 because of the mindset of the factory model, where we have to do this massive summative assessment, there's really no choice, because for accountability purposes and to see what students are actually learning, which is absolutely critical, we need to have a test that's long enough to give an approximation of the curriculum. But we're always in this dance of trade-offs, where we say, uh, well, we can't have it too long, because it'll be just ridiculous and arduous. And so therefore, we have to cut out certain things that are more authentic performance learning tasks and so forth, so we're going to have to narrow the assessment. If we want to make it short enough. And we're sitting there in this dance. Smarter Balanced actually initially wanted to have a 12-hour test. And then they said, you know what, we'll be more reasonable than that. We'll cut it back to eight hours. And their rationale was, well, we will have to cut out a couple of the really robust learning tasks. So the current way, the assessments don't look like they'll be that different. But if you had uh, assessments that were actually on demand as students were mastering concepts, you could actually have truly different assessments. Because as they mastered a, a bunch of standards, they could do a capstone-like project, an assessment for just that set of things, and so forth, and really get those authentic learning tasks targeted. And you wouldn't be in this constant struggle between broadening or narrowing and dealing with length and so forth. Now, in terms of the uh, infrastructure, this would actually dramatically reduce the infrastructure needed from the outset to start being able to deliver next generation assessments online, because not every single student would be taking the online assessments at the same time, taxing the bandwidth and making sure that you had one-to-one -one computers with the right infrastructure from a broadband perspective for every single student. You could switch to the system much more quickly, because instead, maybe 20% at any time would be taking one of these assessments. And so it would shift some of these things dramatically. And then as to the last point about will states sh uh, stick to this after they see the results, the, the speculation right now is that governors will get the results and say, oh my gosh, this is terrible, and they'll just walk away from it. Or what they will do is lower the cut scores, meaning that they'll say, if you got 50% right, you were proficient. 
rather than whatever was intended. And so it's in effect walking away from the higher part of Common Core. Now my sense though is that if we move to this competency-based learning system where say I'm in quote unquote the fifth grade, but I'm reading at a second grade level, and I, at the end of the year what would traditionally happen is I would take the fifth grade test and maybe not look too good even if I had two years of growth, so I was now reading at the fourth grade reading level. In a competency-based system, actually it would say, it would know that I was reading at a second grade level at the beginning, beginning of the year, and then measure me at the end based on the assessment where I actually was, so we could actually see the growth. It would be way more accountable and way more transparent. And it would be from a growth mindset, so you could start to see what students were actually progressing on. And from a system perspective, we would step back and say, this isn't good enough, we need to be better. But at least we would, for the individual parents on the ground, the political uproar, I think, would be a lot less because you would see it from the growth mindset and you would understand the reason I'm not succeeding in that particular place is because this is what I have to do to get better. And so if we move to that high quality competency-based learning framework, I think we can really break a lot of these trade-offs. And psychometricians always tell me that you sort of have to make assessments choose between instruction and accountability. You can't have both. My sense is that Toyota shows us that that's not true, that actually you can have moderating assessments that are on demand that can do both, give you a much more accountable picture of what's actually going on and be way sharper actually in detail and uh, be far, uh, and, 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 and far uh, more robust at informing what students learn next as well. Now, I'm just going to push through a few of these things so I can talk about one last, uh, one last piece of this, which is, um, which is what excites us now is as digital learning is growing, my sense is that if it's to really fill its promise, it's going to have to attack the central thing, which is that we have di different learning needs at different times. That is, we don't all learn in the same ways, at the same paces, and so forth. And some of us learn slowly when a concept uh, uh, comes along. Some of us learn much more rapidly when a uh, concept comes on board. Uh, we have different working memory capacities. That is literally the amount of information we can absorb. And uh, we have different long-term memories, different background experiences that informs our learning and makes it more or less likely that we'll actually learn something. And because of this, if we want to maximize every student's potential, this ability to personalize learning is absolutely critical, which is why this competency-based framework is so interesting right now and exciting. And what we're seeing is that the online learning that's growing, while some of it is in full-time virtual settings, the vast majority, we predict, is going to be in brick-and-mortar schools in what we call blended learning environments. And so I thought I'd give a definition for blended learning and then race ahead on the benefits and actually talk about the different models we're seeing. So forgive the uh, slide order here. But the, uh, the definition that we have for blended learning is, is uh, here's the complicated one and then I'll boil it down. It's basically a formal education program in which a student is learning at least uh, through online learning where they have some element of student control over the time, the place, the path, and or the pace of learning. Those are four critical pieces of it. The second part is at least, it's at least in part in a supervised brick and mortar location, generally a school with a teacher. And the third part of blended learning is that the modalities along each student's path are connected. That is, that students have an integrated learning experience. So what they're learning in, say, small group instruction is not totally divorced from what they're doing in online learning, is not totally divorced from the project that they might do. That is, data connects those different experiences in essence. So to boil it down, and I should be clear with higher ed in the room here, this is a K-12 blended learning uh, definition. It's different for higher education. The, um, but it's basically online learning in brick and mortar schools where students have some control over those elements of instruction and their different modalities are connected. That's basically what blended learning is. And importantly, that rules out a few things. What blended learning is not is simply putting an electronic whiteboard in the front of uh, a classroom and beaming online curriculum at students like I'm doing right now. <clears throat> While uh, many people have uh, invested lots in smart boards over the last uh, many, many years in, in K-12 classrooms, fundamentally this doesn't change the actual pedagogy of learning itself. It doesn't give students that element of control over the time, place, path, and pace of learning. And so it's not blended. 
The other thing that we're not talking about here is simply putting in one-to-one -one laptops or digital textbooks. Those aren't necessarily blended learning either. While those may be important enablers of blended learning, just simply having the technology for technology's sake doesn't mean we've actually made this shift in the model of learning. And it's the model that's way more important than the technology itself. If I can leave you with nothing else today from the competency-based learning discussion and the splendid learning discussion, is that the model is what's really, really critical. And what we're trying to do is shift from a model in which we're teaching an entire classroom to a model in which we're reaching each individual student, wherever they may be. Now, like I said, these things may be important enablers to blended learning, but just because you have them doesn't mean you're doing it. You really have to have that shift to um, uh, that student element of control and so forth. And so there's a bunch of benefits of blended learning, um, which, uh, which I've highlighted here from uh, the ability to individualize or personalize, the ability to boost teacher effectiveness, uh, the ability to get far more robust data and feedback for students, and in some cases, the ability to have cost control or productivity uh, gains. Um, but what we're seeing across the country is that blended learning looks different in different places. There's lots of different models of blended learning, and so a lot of the work we've been doing at the Christensen Institute is trying to define and categorize what these are, because as Sajan knows, uh, a few years ago there was a big discussion where you'd get a couple schools in the room that were clearly doing blended learning, and they would sit there having these arguments about, I'm blended learning and you're not. And it was just this ridiculous conversation. And so what we tried to do is say, you're all blended learning, but you're doing it differently. So Sajan in his work has one model of blended learning. Actually, you have a couple models in your, in your work. Um, and others have other ones. What we've given is a taxonomy here that's pretty confusing in this chart. And so I'll just sort of break it down for you, which is the yellow highlights things that aren't blended learning. Uh, but what I want you to think through is that basically we see brick and mortar schools meet online learning and they have a baby, which is called blended yeah. learning. And that's that uh, middle one there. And then within blended learning, we're seeing four different broad models uh, pop up across the landscape right now from the rotation model uh, to the flex model uh, to the what we're calling the a la carte model and finally to an enriched virtual model. Now, I'll, I'll sort of explain these, but in the rotation model, what we're seeing is that students are rotating between different modalities at fixed points in time. That's within a given course or subject. So within a math class, for example, in a station rotation model, which occurs within a given classroom, Students are rotating from, say, individualized online instruction from one station. Maybe 30 minutes later, they move to small group teacher-led instruction. And then 30 minutes after that, they move to some collaborative activities and stations. This looks very similar to what elementary schools look like and my, uh, already today. So my sense is that elementary schools are going to move rather rapidly in this direction by just simply adding a station that's online learning to what they're already doing. And for many classroom teachers, this will be an easy way for them to get in the game. Uh, now, a second model that I, I actually didn't include in the uh, slide deck is called the lab rotation. And it's very similar to the station rotation. The difference is that uh, rather than rotating within the classroom, students are just rotating to what effectively is a computer lab to do these sorts of activities. Now, that's a little bit harder for an individual classroom teacher to do by themselves. But in coordination with the school principal, this is something that they can relatively easily do. Uh, a third model, also in the rotation category, is the flipped classroom. If you're like me, you're a little bit tired of this uh, phrase at this point because it's gotten a lot of attention, uh, and I've written about that a few times. But the, um, but the uh, classroom is, in essence, I think of as the low-hanging fruit for K-12 education to get involved in blended learning. You allow students to do lectures or the instruction at, at home online, and when they come in the classroom, that's when they really get to apply their learning in rich ways with the teacher. And again, this is a model that any teacher across the country <coughs> could do tomorrow without any permission whatsoever, which is what's so powerful about it. Now, as we start pushing the envelope a little bit, we get into these other uh, models, and the individual rotation is one of these. How many people have heard of Carpe Diem schools? So a handful of people. It's originally based out of Yuma, Arizona. Now they have schools in Indianapolis and are expanding to Ohio next year and uh, trying to move across the country uh, over time. It, they have what's called an individual rotation model. Students are still rotating between different modalities uh, at fixed points in time. Um, but instead 
of rotating to every single uh, different activity, students in effect have an individualized playlist. So if a student needs to spend a double period on online learning, then they do that. If they need to spend more time in intervention with a teacher, then they do that. What happens when you walk in Carpe Diem is they have this huge learning lab with about 250 students in it, each who has their own office, in effect. And they decorate their office based on what they want to be when they grow up. Now, uh, one person actually, one student when they came in, they said, what do you want to do when you grow up? And he said, I want to be a Walmart greeter. Yeah. So they said, okay. Well, so they, what they did was then they brought him to Walmart and said, what are the skills that this person's actually doing that gets you excited? So maybe we can open up a whole bunch of careers that you never knew might be before you before uh, that involve those sorts of skills, which actually was a pretty empowering thing and his vision for himself changed a little bit. But they do their online learning at their offices and then they have uh, basically breakout rooms around the perimeter of the learning lab uh, where they can break out into these glass uh, sort of breakout rooms like you'd see in any office where they can uh, do work with teachers in a variety of different settings. The flex model, which is a wholly different category, is very similar to the, actually the individual rotation. The difference is that students are just moving between these different modalities in a flexible, fluid fashion. So it's not based on a clock that says every 35 minutes you rotate. It's just if, if uh, I need to just uh, bounce out and, and spend some time at the cyber cafe working with some peers on a project for uh, a certain subject, then we do that based on my individual needs. And so it's highly personalized as a result of that. Uh, the a la carte model is what uh, many people here are probably familiar with, with the Georgia Virtual School, uh, where students are taking one, two, three, four classes online, and then the rest of their learning uh, tends to be in the traditional brick and mortar environment. It's very similar in some ways to the flex model. Uh, the difference is that the teacher of record is actually virtual though from the students. So is actually online, whereas in the flex model, the teacher of record is actually face to face with the student. These sorts of models get much more involved uh, such that you tend to need the superintendent or the principal to be actually the one uh, implementing these sorts of things. And what we're seeing from a policy perspective uh, Georgia passed the Clearinghouse Bill last year that uh, Senator Chip Rogers led uh, to create those options for many more students across the state. Uh, and Louisiana and Utah and others have done big measures with course choice. What we're seeing is that the policy environment can actually enable this uh, to make it a far more affordable option uh, more readily for many more students across the state in some pretty important ways. The, the last model that we're seeing occur across the country uh, is what we call the enriched virtual model. And what we're seeing is that for some students, full-time virtual school, while it's an important option to have, it doesn't quite work for them for any number of reasons, and they actually need a physical touch point in many ways. And so having the ability to go into a school one, two, three days a week, where they can work with a teacher and maybe some peers, uh, is a critical piece of the equation. And my personal sense is that actually as the full-time virtual schools continue to grow across this country, they're gonna move more and more toward these blended models over time so that they can effectively serve more and more students. Because my sense is that uh, full-time virtual is an important option for many, but it won't work for the majority in the way it's currently constructed. Um, and so I, I think I'll actually leave it there with sort of that overview of what we're seeing blended learning uh, move across the country. Even in a state as, uh, as far behind them as mine uh, in California, where Digital Learning Now rated us an F uh, on their state report card for having digital learning policies, 73% of unified and high school districts uh, reported doing something with online or blended learning in the latest survey. So this is moving pretty rapidly across the country. I think it presents a fascinating opportunity to personalize learning for students, but we have to get the right uh, conditions on the ground in place so that the implementers can do the work in the right ways. And my sense is freeing up educators to make the right decisions at the right time for students is a critical piece, as is that competency and mastery-based learning platform so that every student moves on once they're truly successful, not simply when the clock has said that they should. So appreciate your time today. I think we have a time for a, a few questions. Thank you.